that's fine. I was just listening to the joy being shared. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But would you join me in prayer? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come into this holy house of the Lord. As we worship and celebrate the Trinity, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit come and make its presence in all of us. The presence of the Spirit in us and around us, we're asking for it to open our minds and our hearts as we share your gospel truth and your love with the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have a lot of new faces this morning, and to you I say, welcome home. This is Pentecostal Sunday. You're going to see a lot of red and a lot of flames, and I hope by the end of this service this morning we can kind of get an understanding of what that's all about. So let us start our reading in Acts 2. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, today we come to remember Pentecost. It is the day the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in transformative ways. So let us open our hearts to receive the message of Pentecost and consider how the Spirit speaks to us today. When the Spirit of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there was a sound that came rushing like a violent wind. And it filled the entire house. Divided all the tongues as of fire. And entered the house to where they were sitting. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak in other languages. As the Spirit gave them. Now there were some devout Jews in the nation under heaven in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd that gathered were bewildered because of the, each other heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native tongue? But Peter stands among them and spoken and speaks the word of the prophet Joel. And at least these last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon you. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy in my name. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even in my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Peter says to them, Repent and be baptized for every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all those who are far away. Everyone whom the Lord calls whom the Lord God calls. So let us open ourselves to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit this morning. May we be bold in sharing the message of Jesus Christ to all who will listen, knowing the promise of Pentecost is for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sing the hymn, Every Time I Feel the Spirit, number 404, your hymnals are up on the screen.
Breath of God. 
scripture reading uh, today is John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. And if you want to follow along in the few Bibles, it's on page 878. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Not 16. But I have said these things to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the rule of the world has been con condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but when you cannot hear them, you cannot hear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last Sunday, we celebrated Mother's Day. It was a day filled with joy and gratitude for our mothers and the nurturing role models in our lives. But for the larger church, that was also Ascension Sunday. And Ascension Sunday marks the moment when Christ, having completed all of his work here on earth, chooses to ascend back to the kingdom of heaven. And his disciples watched as their teacher, right, their friend, and now their savior, was taken up into the clouds. And they were left standing and staring in the sky, wondering what in the world is going to happen next. Well, Luke's version of this story has the disciples off to Jerusalem with great joy. And really, it's a nice ending to a story that begins with angels announcing tidings of great joy to the shepherds. So there's kind of this they lived happily ever after vibe going on right here, right? Christ's story is finished. His, world, uh, his story in this world has come to a satisfying conclusion. And it's all over with. But we today know better than that, right? We know that those disciples will soon suffer in the worst ways imaginable. Ways that they could never imagine. We're no, we know that soon after, they're going to start arguing about little things, right? Like, who's going to clean up after meals? They're also going to argue about great big things. Like, do we Gentiles have to become Jews before we're allowed to become Christians? But to get them through it all, God does not leave them alone. They needed some help. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit comes alongside us. And it helped them out, starting the church, and it helps us today. The Spirit guides us and becomes Christ's presence with us and among us. And we can know today that we are never alone. 
So in Luke's version of this story, the Holy Spirit comes. It comes in on this Jewish festival of Shabbat, which is really the celebration of the Jews receiving the Torah. And it's about 50 days after Passover. And we, at the beginning of the service today, we heard the familiar story of Acts 2. But today's Gospel reading, John and his version of the events, they take on just a different perspective. And to understand Pentecost completely, from John's perspective anyway, we must go back to the upper room on the night in which Jesus washed his disciples' feet and shared just one last meal with them. So we find ourselves in what academics call the final discourse, or the final conversation. And it is the longest speech in all of the Gospels, taking up four chapters. Now we have already heard parts of it over the past few weeks of the Easter season, and now Pentecost brings this season to a close. So as we come to the final words that Jesus gives his disciples before the prayer, let us understand something. This is not a sermon from Christ, or even a teaching moment. Jesus is not leaving his disciples a list of things to do, or step-by-step -step instructions on how to build up a church. No, this final conversation is about reminding the disciples about things they already know. It is a recap, really, of Christ's ministry on earth. Jesus walks with them and repeats himself many, many times. Over and over again, he tells them that he is leaving. Over and over again, he tells them that once he's gone, there will be an advocate that will come. And this word advocate is very interesting. Because only John uses this word here in the Gospel and once in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. But this isn't the usual word for spirit. Most of the time in the New Testament, the word spirit is pneuma, which means to breathe or wind. But John uses the Greek word paraclete, and that means advocate. And this aspect of the Holy Spirit does not come as a mighty wind or tongues of flame. You see, the advocate comes pointing us in the right direction, showing us God's truth and standing with us as we face the world together. Now remember, John's definition of the word, the world, includes everything that is against God. And everyone who does not believe that Jesus is God's Christ. John is a black and white kind of guy, right? For John, there's only two types of people in the world. Those who accept and believe in Christ and those who reject. There's no gray here. There's no option just to accept all the nice teachings and followings of Jesus. It is either you are all in or you are all the way out. You either belong to Christ or you belong to the world. And if you belong to Christ, you have a job to do. And that is to testify that Jesus is the Son of God. But now thanks to Pentecost, you are no longer alone in doing this. There is an advocate that stands with you. We call it the spirit of truth sometimes. And this advocate will support you in your testimony, helping you to tell your own story of repentance and redemption. But remember, it's your story. You are the only one who can tell it. You are the only one with first-hand knowledge of what God has done for you in your life. But what also happens is while you are telling your story, at that same moment, the Spirit is at work and will be working in the hearts and minds of those who are listening. And the Spirit is at work right now. 
But you need this spirit to be agreeing and confirming the truth in what you say. Jesus tells us that the advocate will be busy doing other work as well. You see, it's the spirit's job to confront the world with its wrong ideas about sin and righteousness and judgment. But I do need you to notice and understand something. That it is the Spirit's job to prove the world wrong. It is not your job. And this is a major problem for the church today. Right? As tempting as it is to explain to others just how wrong they are about their sins, they will never understand you. Because they don't know God yet. How can they understand something they have no clue even exists? People won't know what it means to be right in the eyes of God. And they don't have a clue about judgment. But here's the good thing, that's not our job either. Our job is to tell our story. Tell our own story, the story of how God loves humanity, how God has forgiven us, and how God always wanted everyone to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. In fact, I think it would make the Spirit's job a whole lot easier if we would just get out of the way. Let them come to Christ. Because the second we start telling others how wrong they are, we're not doing the Spirit any favors. Because we force people to instantly put up walls. Right? only making the job harder for those who don't know Christ to accept the fact that grace is what was intended all along. You see, what happens is we come across as judgmental or arrogant. And then the entire world sees us as hypocrites because we are criticizing others for the same sins that we commit ourselves. see this all the time on Facebook or Twitter or other social media pages, right? It doesn't take long for just a small disagreement to lead to harsh and cruel words. So instead of intensifying the conflict with other accusations and condemnation, our job is to tell everyone what a difference knowing Christ has meant to your life and the life of other people you know. We are to testify, and that means tell the truth, about what we ourselves have experienced in our own walk with Jesus. Then we make it possible for the spirit of truth to confront any sin that needs to be addressed. You see, the spirit reveals God's righteousness and executes judgment in us and in others. But that can only happen when the Spirit comes. That's what we celebrate today. That is Pentecost. As Jesus talked at length with his disciples that night, he kept repeating over and over again these words, I am going away, I must go away, I have to leave, but I will not leave you orphaned, so that the Advocate can come. I heard this a few months ago, and I thought I'd just add it to the sermon, which is Jesus was human and God, so he couldn't be in all places at once. So he had to go away so the spirit of truth can cover the earth. Jesus is saying, even though I know you don't want to hear that I'm leaving, it is to your benefit that I go. But it's hard for us to let go of the past, right? And to em embrace an unknown future. That's a natural human response. And the disciples are no different, right? They wanted to hold on. They wanted to hold on to what became familiar. They were getting really good at, at the business of following Jesus around wherever he went and helping him do amazing things. But 
now Jesus is leaving. And the Spirit is on the way. And instead of watching Jesus do amazing things, the time has come for the disciples to do the work. Eugene Peterson put it this way, the Holy Spirit will be in them, doing what Jesus did among them. The Holy Spirit is God's way of being present with us. It will make their life work continuous with Jesus' life and work. The way God was present with them in Jesus, God will be present in others, in them. This business of leaving and sending. And Jesus' absence among them becomes the Spirit's presence with them. Everything Jesus said and did among them is continued in what we say he can do. But to embrace the unknown that lies ahead of them, the disciples must be willing to let Jesus go. At least for now. But it isn't just the first disciples who need to be willing to change. You see, the story of Pentecost is not about what happened in the first century. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit keeps moving. Holding on to the familiar, the comfortable, just isn't possible when the Spirit comes. David Luce writes, the Spirit comes to testify that we might testify, often to a very hostile world. The Spirit's presence is at least as disruptive as it is comforting. And why? Because the resurrection isn't more of the same. It is life exploding out of death. So is this really what we want? I mean, I've never heard anyone pray, come Holy Spirit, that we might remain exactly as we are right now. For whatever we mouth today in Pentecost, most of the time, we resist meaningful change in favor of the way things have always been done. You see, but the problem with that is there is no the way things have always been done only the way we've done them in recent memory. Which, of course, really means the way I've gotten used to, them, to things being done. Luce goes on to explain that this focus on tradition, though, is, is more than just comfort and personal taste. He says a lot of the things we do in church, or in our church practices, if you will, we do, quite frankly, because they have worked. And so we trust them. Right? But we need to understand that the population for whom these customs are working is only getting smaller. While the population for whom these things are not working for is only growing larger. Which means it's time. It is time to start innovating, it's time to start exploring new paths and even experimenting in all the ways to figure out what works today for those who are coming now, for those who haven't came in a while, and for those who will be coming soon. We need a dose of the Holy Spirit. However, instead of waiting on the Holy Spirit to come, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit is already here amongst us, waiting for our testimony so it can do the work in others. But as the Spirit testifies that Jesus is Lord and we want to follow where the Spirit leads us, Jesus said to the disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. That includes us. When the Spirit comes, Jesus promises he will guide us to the truth. So this morning I say to you all, claim your flame. Name the truth in the world, knowing that the Spirit is with you, guiding you. And when the Spirit comes, 
is not just someday. The Spirit is here today. So come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Would you please rise as we sing the next hymn of the morning? If you noticed, 
the times are 9 and 10.30, 8.30 and 10. We just need you to pick one, whatever your favorite may be, because pastor is going to start serving two congregations, and we just need to know which way we're going to move. Are we going to move forward up to 10.30, or are we going to move back in the morning and start at 8? So we're looking at the time that you think you like best. So it's just an opinion, but ultimately, as a council, we'll decide the time once we get some input from all of you. I do need this today. If you can fill it out before you leave, we appreciate it. Thank you. You can go ahead and put that in the offering plate at the back of the church, and somebody will pick it up for us and sort them out. I have a couple. Is that okay? okay. <laughs> June 9th. Uh, we are going, it's going to be Baptism Sunday. We have six kids as of right now who are going to be baptized. So if you haven't been baptized, if you're one of those shy people who don't want all the attention up here on yourself, that would be a good Sunday to be baptized with many other people. So that way you're not the center of attention. I know some people really like that. Hold on, Pastor. I have a question. Yes. Why does it make this an infomercial? Yes. What if I don't want to be dumped in the lake with the kids? Can I do it at the church? Yes. So the kids will be here performing the, the baptism ceremonial part, but then we will be going down to Robinson Lake afterwards, I believe your mom's house, and we're going to go out to Robinson Lake, and the kids, some of the kids wanted full immersion, so they will be doing full immersion into the lake. So if anybody would like to be baptized, you know anybody who's not even affiliated with the church, I love baptizing anybody. <laughs> I just need them to fill out a little bit of form, especially if they're not 18 years old, so we can get parental uh, consent, but also so we can get some background information because later in life, people have to find where they were baptized and get that information sent to other churches and other, other things like that. So it's got to be official. So if you, if you know someone who would like to be baptized or you would like to be baptized yourself, June 9th, keep the date and, and let me know. Come talk to me. We can have any kind of conversation you would like. Uh, and that's June 9th. One more is Christian graduation for White Cloud Schools is this coming Wednesday. Uh, I would love it if all of you showed up to support the kids. We usually get about 20 kids and about 100 um, spectators to watch the kids do their Christian graduation. It is just another form of graduation that the kids go through. It's just... They want to do it as Christians, and we want to make that day special for them. So if you could come and support these kids and let them know that they always have a home to come back to and a place, a foundation for them to start from. So that's what Christian, it's previously called baccalaureate, but nobody understands what that word means anymore. So I'm now calling it a Christian graduation for them. No. You have to be baptized to be saved? No, you do not. You are allowed to be saved before you're ever baptized. Your baptism is kind of like your anointment into your Christian life. It is to kick off your Christian life for the rest of your life, which is why mostly kids get it done, or younger adults get it done. Uh, but it, you do not have to be baptized to be saved. You just have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your heart, and you begin that journey there. And that usually leads to a baptism later on down the road. Thank you, Bill. That's a good point. Also, we have a correction. Miss Lori stood up. Thank you. Uh, missions meeting is going to be May 24th, not as it says in the... Yeah. I, I went the wrong way the day. Sorry. 22nd. Oh, the 22nd. 22nd. It'll be May 22nd at 11 a.m. So if you would like to join the mission team, which is the team that picks all our giving. You can see all the money that comes in and see how it all goes out to different uh, missions. And if you would like to be a part of that, that is open to anyone at any moment. And please, we encourage you to come because we would like more input. So uh, that would be June or May 22nd at 11 a.m. <coughs> is that a Wednesday or a Thursday? Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday. One more for the Breakfast Club, formerly known as Men's Group, but we gather up here in the parking lot at 8 o'clock. Recent months we've been consistently going down in the Lego for their basement breakfast. Can I have this church?
the chair. This is Memorial Weekend. We'll travel out to Big Prairie Fire Barn to support their fireman's breakfast. And that is off of Elm, right? Take baseline to Elm? Yep, baseline to Elm and South, and yes, you'll be there within a few miles. Okay. And we'll get Mary's neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rocky. Does baptism have to be performed by clergy? Yes. Yes. Even though we're all considered royal priests in the eyes of God, for this church's sake, it has to be done by clergy. Are there any other questions this morning? If not, I give it back to you. And let's do the closing hymn.